So you've been out there fighting for these lefty principles, yes. but you do talk about this a lot, that there now seems to be an alliance between what has become the left and Islamism. And these are should be things that are completely in conflict, and yet, yeah. I'll tell you why. Today, the left is led by academics and what I call millionaires mimicking misery. When was the last time you heard of somebody going to a steel mill who's a leftist? Right, long time. The okay. left, the idea of justice that Bernie Sanders talks about, even to a certain degree uh, dishonestly, but she does talk about it is uh, Hillary Clinton. She doesn't know a damn thing about social justice. Let me, uh, but I'm digressing. That, that's a whole other show. Oh. Okay, that's it. But this notion of social justice, once accomplished, which means everybody getting public school, getting a breakfast, having a minimum wage, it's reached a ceiling. Now, those it's who have somebody. a problem with the United States of America as a hate system, they, they, they dislike America because they have nothing else to hate. So the Chomskys of this world are brilliant people but I think they are diseased in a way that they can't find anyone else to hate. And they are relating to the Islamists because the Islamists hate America. And so this, what I call Sharia Bolshevism, is on the one side is the naivety of the American academic left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, a false pretense of Islamists, of women in fancy hijabs and stilettos, uh, sprinkling, sprinkling the language with left-wing lingo, you know. They've learned that in their women's studies, gender studies, PhD. It has got nothing to do uh, 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 with uh, 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 social justice. So is that so, is that the most dangerous part that we're seeing on campuses right now, what everyone's calling intersectionality, that all of these, all of these groups on the left, they don't necessarily have anything to do with each other, but if they can figure out who's the most oppressed, they just latch onto each other, and then it, they create a whole other monster. It's make-believe, because I don't see these people involved in the genuine political... Uh, look at the American election system. Yeah. As yeah. much as people criticize it, can you imagine uh, uh, an election campaign that long in Canada? I mean, for goodness sake, the last prime minister pushed it from 40 days to 60 days, and people said, oh my God, what are we gonna do? I can't even imagine people coming out in minus freezing temperatures to attend simple rallies. I, the last time I saw this was in, in Pakistan. I, I simply am fascinated at the involvement of whether they are New England, uh, you know, bright, left-wing people that I see, or even Bible Belt uh, folks from Alabama, I just see the involvement in society as a very left-wing idea. You know, that's really interesting because to me, I guess if we could split the difference between the short election cycle of Canada and ours, which has now become a two-year operation, yeah. I guess if we could somehow get them in between, I think that would be better because yours is very short, but ours, <laughs> is, ours is way too long. I know that, but it's... When you retire, like me, 65 yeah. years and over, it's fun time. It's, it's no <laughs> stop entertainment. Who doesn't want to see Donald Trump? Listen, I, I know it's good for us on Twitter. I don't know how good it is for the, for the nation. But I think, uh, look at it this way. I have friends who are equally comfortable with either Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump. And we, we sat down the other day, about eight of us, and we were discussing late, why are we attracted to both these guys? And the essence is that oh, it's only these two who talk like human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know that Gloria Borger who yeah, comes yeah, to yeah, they, yeah. My God, I think they were made in a factory. <laughs> Sometimes that S, SP, that woman who comes, S she does Oh my God, they are almost as if they were made in Taiwan and just put there and it's shocking. On the other hand, you see some of the women who are reporting for CNN or hostings, brilliant minds. You did John King. You look at, you just get rolled back and say, my goodness, these guys are professionals. But mixing it up are those that are totally, they have no idea what's going on. 
But there are people who do, and I think both Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders know this world better than all the other guys in the race. Yeah, so is that is that the fascinating piece here that we now have, you know, a democratic socialist or a socialist democrat whatever whatever we're calling him right now and we have sort of this ultimate capitalist. Yes. And what they have in common is that they're both against the system, which I think is really ironic because Trump has used the system to make a lot of money and exactly. and and Bernie's used it to become a successful politician, but they're using the system to change the system. That's actually very American. It is, but they are being followed because they are natural human beings speaking. They, are, they don't come anywhere close to S Cup, whatever her name is, or Gloria. They are like you and me. Yeah, they yeah. don't read out of scripts. People associate f uh, uh, frank uh, uh, honesty from both. And that is why, even at his worst, uh, Donald Trump, I mean, imagine winning 46% uh, of the Hispanic vote. I mean, somebody in Canada tweeted, oh, someone explain this to me. I said, I'll explain it to you. You're cut off. You can't even get over how your Chardonnay smells or how you take your coffee. You know, even Starbucks wants you to be a graduate in Latin just to get a cup of tea. <laughs> Fake people. These right. guys are talking ordinary English. So and the People are fascinated by the two. If you're, a, if you're a centrist, or if you're someone on the left, or you're a swing voter, doesn't Trump, for all the crazy things that he says, wouldn't you much prefer, and even if you're on the left, wouldn't you much prefer a Trump president than Rubio? Because Rubio's far more right-wing when it comes to abortion and religion and gay rights and foreign he's policy. Smart. He's smart. Look, I am more... I don't think left and right count anymore. I think honesty and commitment and lack of corruption is what I seek for. When I find out that my sheikhs, I worked 10 years in Saudi Arabia, I worked with the biggest conglomerate over there, and I find their names in the Clinton Foundation list, I'm shocked. Yeah. What are the Saudis doing there? When I look at Obama bending over 90 degrees to uh, uh, hold the hand of the Saudi king, I saw a picture of Hillary Clinton bending over to meet a Saudi prince. I know what makes them bend. I lived there. I won't bend to anyone. Neither do they expect anyone to bend. Nobody bends over. But both Obama and Hillary Clinton, in their gestures, in their movements, tell everyone, We've got something to hide, and you are dumb enough not to understand that. So, and so that's basically that's basically money. I mean, it's basically oil and money. Lots of it. If Pakistan can buy an American Undersecretary of State, you know who I'm talking about. Her files were found in a hotel. No, she wait. Got, I think this is going over me. No, this is uh, the former Pakistan, the American ambassador who died in the air crash with General Ziaul Haq. Oh, yes, 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 yes. His wife, the Under Secretary of State. But what do you mean Pakistan? That file ended up in Pakistan's hands. Huh. The reason she's not prosecuted is she was just let go. She was Assistant Secretary of State being handled by the Pakistan ISI. If Pakistan can do that, can you imagine what the Saudis do to you? And all of you Americans have been told, Iran, very bad, very, very bad, Iran. <laughs> Iran doesn't even have a slingshot to hit you. Right. Not, you know, the Shia, they just beat themselves wild just to prove that they are Muslim. And the way Shias prove that they are Muslim is that if the Sunni says, Jew, very bad, the Shia says, I say 1,000 times, <laughs> very, very bad. And the Americans and Israelis take that seriously. It's the Shia trying to tell the Sunni, I am a better Muslim than you, and in a very pathetic way, screaming at Jews just to prove his Muslimness. Yeah. In the meantime, the Saudis have manipulated the American system. You don't go to be the second largest investor in Twitter and in Citibank, in every American university. What is Saudi interest in Berkeley? How did University of California Irwin uh, just uh, last week rejected a, uh, 
uh, uh, two um, uh, chairs by a Hindu group? Mm -hmm. How does it all work? I mean, you go to follow this and say, it's Saudi money. Right. So is some of that, I, I think some of that, when I hear that, so like the Saudi prince who owns the, sec, you know, the second largest amount yeah. of Twitter, I don't think it's a coincidence that this guy got involved with Twitter and now just in the last two weeks, we've seen, you saw this new trust and safety board on yeah. Twitter and now they're, it's all these people on the left. So we talked about that alliance before and suddenly they're picking all of these people to now police Twitter. And just in the last couple of weeks, we've seen some big time conservatives either have been kicked off Twitter or, or quit themselves. So that really shows the danger of what's going on here, right? See, Facebook security is handled in a city that is run in India. There's a virtual monopoly of Islamists. That's Hyderabad. Throughout 2014, I spent four months in Facebook prison. Oh, you've been, ba you've been banned and kicked off a zillion times, right? Somehow, it got to some people in India who were told that he's being shut out because his security is handled by Islamists. Do you think the Facebook people know that the private company who handles the security in India, who would imagine that? I found that out. I went to the damn office. Wow. I said, come on, I want to meet you guys. It boggles your mind, and we I've got no resources, but if people who do not have resources but have no access to uh, the media, who, thanks to you and thanks to the internet connection, we can talk about this and people can listen, but we are screwed unless and until we wake up, who's the real bad dude in this? You know, it, it's really fascinating, and, I, and I'm glad we're talking about this because I can see the through line. My friend Faisal Saeed al matar who you might know, yeah. uh, Faisal has been banned from Facebook several times. I have never met a more decent person who has escaped persecution, who has made his life about helping people and all the values that we hold dear. He's been banned, and just this week he connected me with a group of uh, ex-Muslim atheists yes, who yes. they've been banned now from Facebook I, this week. And he, and he was seeing if I could help him, and it's like, how is this happening? It's hard to believe it's happening. I'll give, I've deciphered this. I've been, uh, uh, I've been put on the no-fly list of the Toronto Star, the Globe and Mail, the National Post, all newspapers that I've written for, I've regularly written for them. The method they use is, they've got a thousand people willing to send out individually crafted emails Just, to, yeah. to editors and white men who have a fetish for hijab. This is a phenomenon beyond me. I can't understand. I think a whole lot of liberal white men, when they see a woman with a beehive cone-shaped hijab and in stilettos and red lipstick, they're pulp. The <laughs> woman go there and says, well, this is an Islamophobe, you know, Mr. Fatai hates and he's paid by the Jews and the Hindus and I, I don't know how many people pay me. And every other place shut me down. Not just me, I've counted five other liberal Canadian writers, mm -hmm. of us who were involved on the field to ban Sharia in Canada. They identified us, they put these women in those offices as, um, uh, 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 what's the term, uh, apprentice, not apprentices, interns. Mm -hmm. And I could write a book about what is, uh, 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 what's going on and how senior editors are being manipulated. How is it that the New York Times uh, is open to every uh, w woman who would come forward and write something that is patently apologizing about uh, or anti-American. But even as an author or as a weekly column, I can't. No. Right. Because and and they're doing this. They're doing this to Muslim women too, because uh, Asra Nomani, who I'm sure you're familiar with, she, she she's considered not a right Muslim. And who judges who's a right Muslim? is white female feminists. Like, look at what's happening in, in Ottawa. Yeah, I want to talk about this. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, my God. They've declared on a day before Iran's election where the single biggest issue is the right of women to go out and not be in their chastity belt swung around their heads 
since 1979. On one hand, we've got that election on Friday. How do we greet it? On Thursday, the city of Toronto, uh, Ottawa is going to have a hijab solidarity day. This is not some right-wing Alabama town or a backward place somewhere in Mexico that is uh, organizing this. This is one of the most liberal cities in the world with a left of center government in power, with a mayor who's sensible, but deeply soaked in white guilt. And they are going to do that. I wrote uh, in the Ottawa Sun today, I said, you're celebrating the most oppressive symbol of Islamism, and you're making white women come forward and then the jihadis will put these uh, wraparounds and everybody will say, oh, she looks so pretty. Oh, that's, a, that's objectifying Muslim women as if they are some circus animals. Right. You know, say, oh, I love that puppy. What, what is it? Oh, it's a, it's a, you know, a Chinese poodle. Oh, no, no, no. That's a, a bloodhound. We are being d d downgraded from being human beings to being exhibits for white liberals to pity. Right. So, so this is yeah. also interesting because no other religion, and this is what, uh, you know, Bill Maher, who I think originally quoted a speech from George W. Bush, of all people, said the soft bigotry of low expectations. We would never fetishize the oppressive things that other religions do on women. So for ultra-Orthodox Jewish women that have to wear a wig, we would oh. never have other women say, go out and support them by wearing a wig. We, we, we would never have, uh, you know, we would never have, in honor of Christian women, have a bunch of non-Christians dress up as nuns. It, it, it would actually, you could do that on Halloween and it's still ridiculous. It, it's it's left-wing Orientalism. This is racism that the left is indulging it because the left knows we are the champions of anti-racism. How dare somebody accuse us? And under that protection, they are being totally racist. They are treating Muslims as if we are not human beings. And they are patronizing us with their love and affection. Yeah, so that's, I, I've tried to bring this point across several times, that that in and of itself is what real racism is. That real, that real racism is saying that if someone's a black conservative, of who I know many, to be, to be true to their ideals, saying that, oh, they're, they're Uncle Tom's, or yeah. say, or the horror, I mean, I'm sure I don't have to tell you the, the zillion of horrible things that I've seen written about you or said about you. That's real racism. Uh, uh, well, the point is that the left has absolutely no idea how Google makes money. So their textbooks are, were written maybe by progress publishers in 1952 out of Moscow. They're looking for the chimney stack. Hmm, where's the factory? No factory. Where do they, where's the trade union? They don't have a trade union. What do they buy? They don't buy anything. What do they sell? They don't sell anything. Where's the storage? Where is, they have no clue. They haven't yet figured out Google makes billions of dollars and you suckers don't know how it's made. It's the new economy that Karl Marx spoke about in the Communist Manifesto. If you pick it up, he, that guy writing in the shivering winters of England in deep poverty knew what was happening. These idiots who picked up like the Red Mao books of the 60s, you know, without reading anything about the economic process, are profoundly giving lectures on uh, issues that are social, so homosexuality, gender, rights, abortion. How is this applicable to that farmer in India who's committing suicide because there's no rain or because the banking system has failed him? He can't pay back loans. I mean, I, I keep giving examples of India because India is the future of humanity. I mean, it's got, what, 26 languages, six religions. They've never been, uh, there's never been a civil war between any two states. I think, I think, if I'm not mistaken, India was the only country during the Holocaust that didn't ship Jews out of its borders, right? Not only that, a fascinating thing. You go to the original uh, Jewish city of Cochin, where the first uh, Jews settled. It is also the first city 
where the Muslims uh, made a mosque while Muhammad was alive. And today, Jewtown in Cochin is uh, surrounded by uh, Muslim stores, Kashmiri Muslim stores. It's just fascinating if you visit that. Wow. And it, so is there actual, so there's real coexistence? I mean, I know there's not many yeah. Jews left in India, but... But they're still there. Yeah. There is an absolute absence of anti-Semitism in India. Even in Pakistan, when we were growing up, I, I write about that in my book, The Jew is Not My Enemy, that there was a movie called, uh, that was a hit that was called uh, Daughter of the uh, uh, Yehudi Kilerki, The Daughter of the Jew. And it was a, a, a Roman adaption of a Roman uh, a gladiator sort of a play in which the heroine was a Jewish woman. We had Jews as our neighbors in my, uh, in my school, where we mm -hmm. uh, went to school. You couldn't imagine the 67 war really uh, brought all of this back. But I see the, the India of the future of having people who are asked often, where do you come from? <laughs> from India. I thought they were from China or something. You've got people who are white, more white than anyone in America. And I've seen people who are black, who are Af of African origin. And how could a country that speaks 24 languages and have so many elections? And the worst thing that happens is a riot in JNU University in Delhi nowadays, where there's a scuffle going on. And everyone says, oh, well, you see the Hindu extremists, they're very bad. Well, what are they doing? They're not saying blow up the world. <laughs> of course, they're nasty pieces of work over there. Sure. Nothing compared to what ISIS or the Muslim Brotherhood or the Pakistani Jamaat Islami are doing. They want to destroy human civilization. Yeah. By the way, we should mention that India is literally the world's largest democracy, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Modi just won. It was the most people that have ever voted in a democratic election but, ever. And, and it has never, ever been accused of voter fraud. <laughs> well, that's coming. That's coming. No, it can't come because no? last ten, uh, last three elections, Indian votes are counted on computer machines. There's no paper involved. Hmm. Within an hour of the polls, the results get transferred and hit. And India does its election over a ten-day period. So, uh, not a ten-day period. I think it's a month it takes, but it goes into segments, groups of states, and they move on. The result doesn't come out. But once it's done, boom, it takes hardly an hour and the total results come out. You will never hear somebody saying, oh, there was cheating over here. You can't cheat. For all the uh, backward uh, industrialization or whatever they have to progress, they're on the front line okay. of protecting democracy. For them, this, uh, the value this, uh, of a vote is far more important than the value of the rupee. Hmm. And that's significant. Yeah, so I wish people knew about this more, and that's why I, I really enjoyed your TED Talk and, and one of the things that you said about that, how the partition led to sort of, it, it's like having your arm cut off. Absolutely. That it, it still exists, and you sort of alluded to this earlier, that all of these people, whether they're in Pakistan or India or Kashmir, that they're, they're, still, they're still dealing with the wounds of of being a nation and having different religions and all this stuff. So I think that's a perfect segue. You basically are the only person that I have seen on Twitter, I think literally the only person that is talking about what's happening in Balochistan right now. Yeah. And I know, so we're doing a lot of history stuff here. Yeah. So without getting, without getting too deep, can you, no. for people that have no idea, that have never even heard of this place, can you explain it's a little bit? It's like Germany, that's the area, Germany or Poland equivalent. It's about a 5,000 year old civilization. Their language is distinct. Uh, as a result of uh, British presence there, Balochistan got divided. The major part became an independent state in 1947. Parts of it were given to Iran by the British, and a small part in the north went to Afghanistan. So it's still, like Kurdistan, I would say it's occupied by three other fellow Muslim countries. If it had been occupied by some Jews, it would be in the front. Of course, of, of course. course. You know, you, 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 these Jews, you know, 
Why is it <laughs> occupied by Mossad? Yeah, <laughs> that would get a little press. Uh, you know what? I'll make a call to my Mossad guys. Yeah. We have a BDS movement against Israel. Yeah. So this was a country equivalent to what is Burma or Ceylon or Nepal. So it became independent as the first independent state before India or Pakistan got their independence. The person who got them their independence through the legal framework charged them his weight in gold, a hundred and I think it was 145 pounds of gold bullion that he charged as legal fees. Huh. Out of the sincerity, they gave that to him. Uh, uh, the, the Brits awarded the freedom. It was a state of Kalat. I have documents to that in the New York Times. It was announced India, Pakistan, and Kalat. Kalat was the state of Balochistan. Within a year, that same guy, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who's considered Pakistan's founder, ordered Pakistani troops to invade, occupy, and kill the... Uh, and at that time, the state had an upper house, a lower house of parliament, and a, a sort of an, a constitutional monarch, gone. Wow. I lived there a year in prison in 1970. That's how I came to know, because it's a very remote area. It's as big as Germany, its population is only 8 million. So it, it is as rich as you can imagine. Mountains of gold, oil under the ground, uranium, you name it port city that sits at the mouth of the Persian Gulf, at the Straits of Hormuz, strategically vital to the West. Yeah. Nobody gives a damn. The Chinese have taken that port. They have a nuclear submarine base being built over there. And because there's no coverage, the Chinese are building a highway over the Himalaya, straight into Balochistan, which will save them 6,000 mile journey and go straight to where the oil is, and America is sleeping. So that's, that's really incredible. So I, I hope that some people listening to this will just Google the Straits of Hormuz to really understand how strategic it is, and that it's, you know, it's right by Iran, and uh, I think, uh, was our soldiers that were, our Navy men, were they in the Straits of Hormuz? Just, uh, they, of course, they yeah. were there. Yeah, we were, the, we were right there. You see, uh, the, the, the name to remember is Gawadar, G-W-A-D-U-R, that's the port. That, by the way, was the easternmost part of the Arab Empire. It was from the Sultanate of Oman that had a base over there. What's happening today is a genocide. Almost daily, about 50 people, 50 bodies are found. People are arrested and they disappear. In Canada, we managed to get three or four of the female refugees. Imagine being a single woman and running away into the mountains or hiding. We had to get them over here for the safety. More will come, inshallah, as the Muslim says. <laughs> and, but the men are being dropped into ravines. Their wells are being poisoned by the Pakistan military. Everything that you read about uh, Cambodia and the green orange and how uh, the Viet Cong were uh, treated is happening today. The same jungle warfare is being implemented. Surround the village, burn the uh, the the wheat field and poison uh, the wells. The population has to move. And why? Because this Chinese highway, for which the Chinese are paying $40 billion to the Pakistanis, they have asked that 50 miles on both sides of that highway has to be depopulated. And straight from Goada, right up north, depopulated. All Western reporters uh, go there to Islamabad. They dare not. The Lee's Doucettes of the BBC. The, uh, the only guy who stood up to the Pakistani was Declan Walsh of The Guardian. Mm -hmm. He was expelled. There's another uh, a female, uh, Carlotta Gall of The New York Times. She was beaten up when she filed her report for The New York Times. She left. Nobody can enter it. 16 journalists have been killed for merely entering that area. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, listen, I, there's so much history here and we just started, there's so many more things. I, we barely talked about Canada and a, and a whole bunch of some of the stuff you've tried to do with progressive Muslims. So I hope you'll, you'll come back on. Um, but one final thought, what, when we talk about all of this stuff, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get people to understand other parts of the world and, and understand some of the rich history. What's the, what's the one takeaway you would want people to have to know about more of this, to get engaged, to understand that there are parts of the world that are terrible things are happening that nobody pays any attention to? I would say get involved in the American political process on either Bernie Sanders' side or on uh, Donald Trump. Both these guys know so much more, or are willing to talk about it, whether you're on the left or the right. God has been very kind to Americans to give both sides of the political divide people who are speaking frankly and honestly. You know, it's a choice. And in that process, you will find out. And I'm hoping somehow that these two gentlemen would address I, I can bet you they know what's happening because Donald Trump has mentioned God. it a couple of times. He's referred to it as to what's happening in the Middle East and in India. He'll never say a bad thing about India. You notice that. He mm. slams mm. everybody. Why? Because he sees that the Indians don't desire anything other than live and let live, but he notices the potential of science, technology, innovation, and humility. I mean, it's not, it's not uh, a, a, a coincidence that the head of Google, the head of Microsoft, uh, you know, major uh, places of excellence, there are Indian Americans coming up. More than any other group for a very small community, they're showing excellence. Because the whole Indian ethos is to learn, to learn, 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 you know, and that's where... Americans should need to see India for what it is. It is the future of this world. Yeah, well, listen, I know you're going to India in a couple of weeks, and I, yep. I would love to visit sometime. So maybe maybe you'll Good. give me a tour in the next year or two? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Tarek. You can find Tarek on Twitter, at Tarek Fatah, and you can learn more about his work and find out where his books are and all that at TarekFatah.com.